thing so that you can put the baby to bed. Um, yeah, it's. I'm going to uh, start letting people in. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure Kathy already knows this, but we did not receive a reply from the other side. So um, this will be an opportunity for uh, me to ask you some general questions about your candidacy. And then if we have anybody in the webinar or the Facebook who wants to ask questions as well, you'll be ready for that. But given the limited amount of time, I'm sure it's gonna be um, Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So sounds great. Oh my gosh. And remind me again what your daughter's name is. Clara. Clara. I don't know why. I always <laughs> want to call her Emma. And I think it's because uh my daughter's favorite TV show of all time is Friends. And whenever I think of cute babies, I think about <laughs> friends and so and your daughter is very cute so Clara oh, thank you which is also really did, did that come from anywhere um we part of why we picked it we really like the name but I I love that it means like brightness and, and she's like the brightness in our lives you know such a it's been such a dark time the last couple of years so I really feel like she's our brightness um so that might help you remember <laughs> but um but then we found out recently that she had a great 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 grandma named Clara and we had no idea oh all right well Clara a clarifying like you know better understanding she's shining a light on all of us I like that that's that's going to be the way that I remember it because you you know you're not Rachel and Ross you're an actual human <laughs> being <laughs> so um, I can see that Lindsay's letting people in. She's going to go ahead and, oh, it already has started live on Facebook. So great. Um, without further ado, because, you know, I know that your time is very limited. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and kick this off and get it started. Uh, so good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us at Secular AZ today. We are a 501c3 organization focused on protecting the constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade. We have some great programming, including a series of candidate forums that have been happening Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. Um, you know, uh, we transitioned recently from our school board candidates to now the statewide candidates. Super excited that tonight our uh, first statewide candidate is joining us. Next Wednesday, we will have a forum for the Arizona State Treasurer candidates at 6 p.m. Uh, you know, this is a, an important race that unfortunately a lot of people don't really pay attention to. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the candidates there. Um, this We also have programming that happens on Friday. And this Friday, our guest is Uncage and Reunite Families Coalition, and they are going to be discussing the illegal treatment of children and families at the border, including forced abandonment of religious items. So some folks might think that we don't pay attention to, uh, you know, preserving the religion of folks in the state of Arizona, but we really do. And we wanna make sure that everybody has equal protection under the law. So I'm really looking forward to that. There are many more as you all can see. Um, and if there is somebody that you'd really like to hear from, or if you have personal connections to prominent free thinkers that you can connect us with, please by all means reach out to info at secularaz.org. Uh, for tonight, both candidates received an invitation to participate, but only one candidate answered the call, and that candidate is H Kathy Hoffman. She was first elected in 2018 and is one of the only actual teachers. Let that sink in. One of the only teachers <laughs> uh, who has been elected into this position. She has also spent her entire career working in public education, first as a preschool teacher, and then as a speech pathologist. She began her career in the Vail School District in Southern Arizona before joining the Peoria School District. And I'm just gonna go ahead and add um, uh, Superintendent Hoffman. I still, I'll never forget when you first came to an LD24 meeting back in, could have been 20, 
2017 or 2018. And at the time you were running against somebody who was a very prominent local politician. And the folks that were sitting at my, you know, along my shoulders and I were like, is this person <laughs> um, thinking she's got to be crazy. There's no way nobody's ever heard of her. But we all ended up leaning in and listening with bated breath to your every word. We really did. And then I just kept seeing you over and over and over again. Her experience as both an educator and advocate for students with disabilities informs her vision for public education. Throughout her career, she has fought tirelessly for equal access to high quality public education, regardless of a student's race, gender, or zip code. Um, and here's where you might have to correct me again, because I have a couple of fun facts for the people who are participating tonight. Um, I believe that you're the only elected, and I don't know, maybe it's uh, if it's state superintendent to give birth while in office or state elected representative to give birth while in office. Which one of those is right? <laughs> it's, uh, as far as we know, first state superintendent from any state, so in the whole country, to have a child while in office. Which shouldn't Ever. even, <laughs> it shouldn't even be a topic of conversation, but it just goes to show how, you know, it's, it's not easy to be able to juggle, juggle all of these different roles that you have. Um, and then the other one is, I think that you might be the tallest female elected official at the state Ever. level, is that right? That I don't have record of, <laughs> to say with certainty. <laughs> but I do love also that um, in this role as a state elected, we've had many women elected to this role, whereas in other states, it's very uncommon to have women elected to state positions. But I think it was around 1926 or the early 1920s that the first woman was elected to this role. So I follow in strong footsteps, even if they were not as tall as me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So what I do know though, for a fact, is that we're really grateful that you were able to take time out of your busy schedule to talk to all of us. Um, uh, but because your schedule is so busy and you have a baby who likes routines, thank goodness, uh, we're going to be go ahead because I'm going to just go ahead and share with our people here today. We never received a response from um, an, uh, the other candidate on the other side, Tom Horn. So because this is really just a forum for you to be able to talk about your campaign, we're going to go ahead and end it at 645. So if you have any questions for Superintendent Hoffman, now is the time to go ahead and drop them in the chat. And uh, again, welcome Superintendent Hoffman. Is there anything from your bio that I'm missing that you would like to share with the people? Um, I think you covered it. I look forward to sharing about what some of my accomplishments have been during my first year in office, along with what my vision is for my next term. All right. Okay. So like I said, go ahead and put it in the chat if you do have questions, but I would like to talk about your tenure. Um, you know, you headed up the ADE coming in 2018. This is right after the massive red bread movement. We saw that sea of red that, uh, you know, ended up at the Capitol, uh, a really, um, I don't know if volatile is the right word for it, but just, you know, there was a lot going on. People were feeling frustrated and wanted to have their voices heard. And, and that was the year that you stepped up to run, um, which in and of itself is admirable. Uh, you got the most votes, you came in, uh, and then 2020 hit. So how did you disseminate all the information coming from the CDC, Arizona public health officials, the governor's office, ASBA, you know, all of your various other organizations who were weighing in because it was really almost a traumatic event for people who, um, you know, we all thought that we were just gonna say goodbye to our kids for a minute, for a week or so. And then the next thing you know, everything is shut down. I can't think of anything more difficult than dealing with that. So how, how did you go ahead and 
you know, handle the information that was coming in and make the very tough decisions that you needed to make as the head of Arizona's public school. Uh, well, first, uh, that was an incredibly traumatic time for me as well, being in that position of seeing the transition in March of 2020 for our schools transitioning to remote learning was, I just, I, I never ever in a million years could have imagined being in that position or being, um, seeing that that happened to our schools and to across, and not just our schools and, you know, even our homes, we're all, we're all shut down, right? Um, but I think where uh, part of where we were able to have some success in disseminating information was because prior to the pandemic, even prior to being elected, I had already started that groundwork of traveling the state. So even during my campaign, I was visiting and um, building relationships across the state with our school leaders, with teachers, um, you know, really making sure that I was, I was not uh, focused in on the, the Phoenix community only, but also really getting out to every part of the state. And then I was very intentional about that when I um, started in the, in the Department of Education in 2019 visiting um, schools in all 15 counties, and really strengthening those relationships and working with the education organizations as well. So when the pandemic hit, um, one, um, and we actually developed some communication practices that we continue on today because it, it actually has become a part of our routine and best practice. So we um, have weekly meetings with the education organization leader. So that includes the school board association, the school administrators, um, AEA, uh, the, including the charter association, really all these organ the um, ASBO, the school business officials, we, we bring them, um, I meet with them on a weekly basis to make sure that any major updates from the department is communicated out so that they can share that with their with their memberships and also it goes both ways and they, they can bring questions to us about concerns and issues that they're hearing from their members. Um, we also started holding virtual weekly meetings open to all school leaders so that could be for any administrators, principals, superintendents, school board members, and um, on, on various topics so these were just 30 minute presentations once a week that people could drop in on and and we use that time when there were updates on public health, like from the CDC and, and the Department of Health Services, as a way to communicate out to the field and be available for, for questions. And there's also been a lot of questions on, on technical assistance needed and how to spend the federal COVID relief funding, because that's been an unprecedented amount of funding, over $4 billion total of relief funds for Arizona K-12 education that we've been allocating. So I do think that those communication channels uh, were really important. And I mean, of course, there were others like email, social media, um, interviews with the with all the media, you know, and really trying to uh, utilize every avenue possible. But um, but I think that some of those communication channels that we developed are important that we continue those today as well. Well, and I think you recall too that you uh, you did kind of a, a tour after being elected in 2018 of districts that had literally never seen their state superintendent come visit their schools. Is that true? Yes, that was a common theme as I traveled to some of our most rural schools. I heard time and time again that they had never had the state superintendent visit ever, and also not even a state elected to their community. Um, and so I, I do, I, I've always felt this is such a privilege to be in this position. And I love to honor our communities by visiting them in person, by touring and Oftentimes they will invite in parents or even the mayor and other important community members to meet with me during my school visits, people who are important in the community as well, so that we have that opportunity to uh, get to know each other and to learn about their concerns. And, um, and, and uh, I think that's, that's been really valuable in my school visits. You know, and I think too, you know, as someone who spent my entire adult life in Maricopa County and in the Phoenix metro area, um, I, I'm a bit 
ignorant about the issues that face our rural schools. And, and you know, my background is in education, also as a school board member, and the value in going to, you know, ASBA, the Arizona School Board Association events, where I would get to sit at a table with someone from like Chinley or, mm -hmm. you know, Sierra Vista or whatever. For me, that was always such an interesting perspective to get. What are the biggest issues facing those rural districts that so often many of us who live in the metropolis areas or metropolitan areas of Arizona, what are the things that they really need and want from their elected officials? So the, the challenges facing our rural schools are unique. Um, they, so I know one is, it's very challenging to pass bonds and overrides in rural parts of the state. They tend to have a more conservative voter base or um, voters who uh, maybe don't, don't have kids in the schools that are not as invested in, in investing um, additional of, of their tax funds towards the local schools. And so I would say one of the biggest needs in our rural communities is the, the need to access funding for upgrading facilities. They, I, for example, I've shared before about when I visited Quartzsite, Arizona, it's, um, they have a very small student population. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it, I think it was like less than a hundred kids in this um, little, <laughs> Oh, for their elementary school that I visited, but they had portable buildings and they were very outdated. They, they, really, they really shouldn't be using them anymore. Um, they are not well insulated. They're just very old and decrepit. And so that was one of the main things they wanted to share with me was they, because partly because they have such a small student population, they don't um, qualify for, from the state to, for funds to build a new school but they also don't have the means from their community to pass a bond to build a new school. And so they're just stuck. And I think all our kids deserve to learn in adequate school buildings that are safe and insulated in the heat. Um, Quartzsite is not one of the cooler places of the state. It's not, you know, it is hot in Quartzsite um, during most of the year. So um, that really stood out to me. Another example of that is I was recently in San Luis, Arizona, um, right on the border near Yuma, and I visited the Gadsden Elementary School District, and they had a very robust preschool program. And um, they said they are completely at capacity. They have a wait list of 100 kids that want to ask that their families are requesting to send their kids to the preschool, but it's a matter of not having enough facility space and buildings like additional classrooms to, to open up new classes for these preschool programs that um, they can other grant funds for things like teachers and materials, but they simply don't have the space and there's not a good avenue for them to, to expand and, and build out new buildings. So I would say that's a one thing that's a little more unique to rural parts of the state, whereas in, in Phoenix, you know, it's maybe depends on what part of the valley you're in, in terms of being able to pass a bond and having that voter base support, but um, but we do, I do, no, you just notice it in Phoenix, um, the schools, um, we, we do have more resources and more opportunities in that way. Um, the other, you know, of course there's issues in educator recruitment and retention. I, as a, as a speech language pathologist, that can be very difficult to, find for rural communities. And there have been times when a superintendent is giving me a tour of their rural school and said, hey, by the way, would you have time to do a speech evaluation while you're here? And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not really <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> but um, they really, you know, kind of half joking, um, but they, but because they have a really hard time getting people, having the specialists come out to rural parts of the state to provide those critical services. So that's um, a huge need. Um, so I'll just, I'll stop there, but there, there are very unique needs, you know, the, typically the, the school principal is also the special ed director, might also be the bus driver, they're really wearing a lot of hats and have a lot of responsibilities. Yeah, and I think that's, that's like a, a bit of a luxury for those of us who are in the more urban areas that we don't really necessarily think about it. And I recall just recently, actually, um, in the you know discussion about this voucher expansion, which we already have a question, of course, with the voucher expansion in the chat, and I'll get to that in just a second. But like, 
I remember seeing either this week or last week a post by you on one of your social media platforms about how, okay, now we've expanded vouchers to anybody under the sun who feels like they need something outside of our, you know, traditional K-12 public education setting. Um, But what, and, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but like what percentage of kids who live in these rural areas can actually, can actually access that. How many of them actually could access this voucher to the tune of $7,000 that is essentially a down payment to put into private schools that can do who knows what, Um, you know, how many, how many of our rural communities can actually access that and put their kids into some kind of private school? Well, it's actually been, even not to make things more horrifying about the situation, but um, I'll share an example of when I was visiting the Superior um, community and the Superior schools. And I um, had a lunch with the community members as well. And they brought up the concern about vouchers uh, even before universe, this is long before universal voucher expansion actually, um, because this was, I visited their schools back in before the pandemic. Um, And they shared that a woman who had no background in education had opened a private school right across the street, right down the right down the road from superior schools, knowing that students would qualify because um, one of the qualifying categories was if you are in a boundary of a school that has a D or an F. And so unfortunately, that school had that rating. And so the, this woman was advertising to the families there, promising them the moon, like come to my private school. And um, they were able to recruit a certain number of students. It wasn't a huge number, but when you're a small rural school, even 10 or 20 kids a uh, drop a uh, drop in enrollment, that's like the equivalent to a full-time teaching position in terms of the funding. So this had, a, this was major, basically ended up being a major budget cut for the superior schools. The kids transferred over to this quote unquote, private school. Um, They also recruited some teachers. Ultimately, this school got shut down because they were not providing meals to kids and they were not paying the teachers. And so within just a couple of months, this whole experiment of this, again, this woman with no background leading a school was shut down and those kids transferred back into Superior having missed their first couple of months of school. And there's no accountability for any of that because as far as what the law allows is those families qualified for the vouchers. She opened a private school, which she is, it's her business to open, um, you know, to profit off of our, our education tax dollars. And it had devastating impacts. She promised the moon and completely fell short. And that has, that has tremendous harm on rural communities that, that don't have the means to be flexible around those types of situations. And that's, that's not good for kids. That's not good for teachers. That's not good for, for anyone. So that's what I mean when I say there's no accountability um, for, you know, once the money is to the parents and they decide what to do with that, um, you know, private schools don't have to be accredited. And there's, um, there's just, a, a, to me, it's like a black hole for what happens to education dollars. So, okay, let's just get this straight because I think that you and I have uh, an intimate understanding of of what is happening in public education in Arizona and we have for as long as we've been doing this job. But like you're saying to everybody right now that somebody without any kind of um, certification, qualifications, background, et cetera, was able to basically say, I'm going to open up a really wonderful, you know, alternative option for all of you parents here in Superior, Arizona, which I love Superior. They have a really good hamburger shop there downtown. Um, But like then when that didn't work out, where does the money go? If we're talking about like, especially, you know, like, because I hear a lot of talk about fiscal responsibility and local control and small government and all this kind of stuff. So the money that that individual took out or or received, I guess, from John Q. taxpayer, did they have any obligation to pay that back after their school failed? 
Nope. You can be, if you open it like a business, you close it like a business. That money is paid out the door. There is, there is no way, no um, requirement for her to pay it back. Okay. The so, other yeah. thing that, um, again, going back to accountability of what's happening in these types of situations is uh, the lack of accountability over how the kids are doing academically. And, and especially for kids, I have a lot of concerns for kids with disabilities um, because the students who are attending private schools no longer fall under the IDEA federal special education laws. So they do not, there's no requirements to have annual IEPs updated. There's, um, these schools don't have to accept students with disabilities at all. They can turn away any students they like, um, but I do have concerns over how do we know that, um, that services that are needed are being provided, that students are making progress. There's no state assessments given. So it literally kids could, um, you know, we just don't know, are they, are they being taught how to read? It's, I don't understand why we have such high standards for what is being taught in our public education system and not in our, if, and now we're using tax dollars to fund our private education system with, again, creating a, a black hole as how I see it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we already have a few questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the first one. This one comes from Tiara Kraus. And Tiara, I hope I'm saying your name right. She says, what do you foresee happening with the voucher issue if the question is not eligible to be on the ballot for a second time? So I guess that's part one. And then part two is how do we mitigate the impact of those consequences? So I'll repeat it. What do you foresee happening with the voucher ish issue if the question is not eligible to be on the ballot and how do we mitigate? So what I'm hearing is that it, per sources, it does not appear that the referendum was successful. Um, so we anticipate that that we will have to be um, in the process of implementing the universal voucher expansion. So I'm so sorry for anyone that did not already hear that news, um, but that appears to be, we're still waiting for the official uh, Secretary of State verdict on the SOS referendum, but that is what we're hearing is that it appears they did not get enough signatures. Um, so, what that means is um, what we've already seen is uh, I don't have I don't have the most up to date numbers as of today, but I know that we had already seen over 10,000 uh, kids families applying for universal voucher expansion and that over 75% of these students are already enrolled in private schools. So what we anticipate happening is that um, essentially as I was saying, the, the general fund and our tax dollars will be essentially funding private education for, um, for these over, over um, 10,000 students, which is actually over double, we will be, because the program already had 12, over 12,000 students. So basically overnight, we're, we're gonna be doubling the size of the program, but the majority of them, like I said, over 75% are already attending private schools. So, so far we're, we're not anticipating any kind of like exodus from public education. Um, and, and the funds can also be used for homeschooling. So that could also have an, an impact, especially in rural parts of the state. Um, the second part of the question, how do we mitigate the impact of those consequences? I think this will be about educating people and putting pressure on lawmakers of what is, why, like, why are, why are we as citizens and Arizonans allowing this as I, I mean, I'm just saying the same points over and over again, but our tax, our education tax dollars to fund a system where there's no accountability of how those dollars are being spent and, and what type of education those kids are receiving. There's recently been news in the New York Times about um, Jewish schools in New York City, about how they received $4 billion of public aid and those kids are not even receiving the most basic education. That's basically what's happening here, just on a different scale. Yeah, it's a, uh, again, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, you're the party of small government, local control, fiscal conservatism. None of those things seem to be true anymore. Uh, and we're all kind of coming up to that 
conclusion, whether we like it or not. Um, the same uh, attendee says, thank you for being available to the con constituency, Kathy. Uh, oh, this is good. So what is happening with resources and support for trans students in our public schools? Great question. And it's a wonderful question. And I wish I had better news. Um, this is an issue, you know, we, in terms of just first broadly speaking more about our LGBTQ students, knowing that this is one of our more vulnerable student populations and knowing that they need specific services and supports. Um, I have been working with um, educators, parents, LGBTQ students together to be making sure we're providing resources to support our LGBTQ students and was very proud that back in 2019, we worked in a bipartisan way to repeal the horribly offensive no promo homo law. So I, I was feeling like we were making good strides and we, we have also put resources on our website that I've been personally attacked for having resources to support our LGBTQ students, but I feel it's important to have resources on our website to support our LGBTQ students. Um, but then this past legislative session, the governor signed into law two laws that were directly targeting and, and really negatively attacking um, trans students specifically. And this has just become a, a political issue, but ultimately it's very harmful for, um, for students that are, that, I, that are trans and that um, it makes, you know, it makes life harder. I've, I've heard from families where their kids just don't feel safe, um, especially knowing that this is how their government is treating them and targeting them. And so some families leave Arizona because they, because there are such challenges in finding safe and inclusive environments for them. Um, so I will continue to be a strong advocate. I've done press conferences. I work closely with with um, groups like with, like Typo, which is a, a parent group for trans kids. And um, we'll continue to, to be a voice whenever possible, but I wish I had better news for where we were at as of today. Yeah, we recently had a group um, called Equality Squad uh, based in Tucson, who was that, they were actually established by a Republican mother uh, in Tucson, whose child came out to her as trans. And I will never forget when, and they show up to the Capitol all the time. Like they're coming up from Tucson. So they're, you know, driving two hours to be able to get there. And she always introduces herself as I am one of your constituents and, you know, tries to put a human face on her child and, the, and what they go through. And unfortunately it always seemed to fall on deaf ears. So um, we'll make sure that we pay attention to what's going on with regards to that, but it's a, it's a weird time. Um, let's see. So I want to make sure that I'm getting to all of it. Uh, okay, this one comes from Mary. I think this might be Mary Ganapol, who is one of our um, board members in Tucson. She says, I attended a candidate forum for Tucson Unified School District. Candidate Val Romero favored an ESA voucher expansion and said it would be great for public schools because so many uh, because so many students would leave public school that we could finally have small class size. Okay, I think that was more of a comment because she said the audience groaned. Um, but I think she brings up a really important point that we now have people who are running for our local school boards, which truly is the heart of our democracy, who are running on things that would kind of, you know, fast forward the demise of our public schools. So I guess if I were to ask you a question now, you know, we are both educators, lifelong educators. Um, we've spent time in the public schools. We've gotten familiar with charter schools. We know enough about private schools, but like, you know, what, what do you say to this anti-education movement and the folks who are actively running, it seems, to dismantle the public schools from within and, and, and maybe like, and, and I don't expect you to have all the answers, but like, what could we do as just regular people to try to combat that? Because 
clearly everybody here on this call cares about their public schools enough to show up on a Wednesday night and, and meet up with their uh, superintendent of public instruction. Well, I think that while we want people to be educated about the challenges that our schools face, like you, like you were saying, that's what Red for Ed was all about, was educating and really bringing to light the challenges that, um, that our schools are facing. But I also think that we need to find balance in also sharing about the amazing achievements of our schools and celebrating their successes. Because if we only hear about every single thing that's going wrong in our schools and don't talk about what's working and what the solutions are, then I think the the public feels like this is a, like this public school system. This is just a broken system that we shouldn't put any more. We're already putting so much money in, and it's just broken and failing and failing our kids. So I um, I really make that a priority in my messaging to like yes, make sure we're prioritizing what the biggest challenges are for our schools, but then also. Uh, celebrating and talking about the successes and the and where we're actually moving the needle in the right direction. So I mean, I love sharing that. For example, I one one thing I'm, I've been trying to get the word out about is that the national 2022 rural teacher of the year is from Arizona, and he's from he's a chemistry teacher in Wilcox, Arizona, and I'm just so proud of him and. Um, want to make sure we keep celebrating that that Arizona is on the map for the for the national rural teacher of the year. Um, our students are competing nationally and winning awards. I was recently in, in, at the San Luis High School where one of their robotics projects had won sixth place at nationals. Um, just things like that where we we need to show what what's working because I, I'll, also I'll hear from community members who don't have a, a, a current connection to the schools, like don't have kids in the schools. And I, one question I get a lot is like, well, why, like, how can we bring back shop and, and like home ec and have like vocational skills at school again? And I'm like, well, actually we have phenomenal career programs in our schools. Today, I went to the Coding Academy, which is a Phoenix Union high school. They are learning cybersecurity skills. They shared about one of their former students who's attending ASU, but he's making $50 an hour on the side in um, doing cybersecurity. Uh, they, they do, of course, coding and uh, all, all kinds of tech and design. And they do a lot of project-based learning and integrated coursework and um, so I think the more I think while yes we Arizona has work to do to support our students and teachers but we also have so much to be proud of and we I think we just need to make sure we're getting out those positive messages as well so that the public feels good about adding investments and supporting our public education system which if you're a part of our schools you already know it's one of the best places to work. The kids are amazing. The the support community is amazing. I, I loved being an educator. I loved everything about it. So I think that I, um yes. <laughs> I just what I, I love that. And and I don't know if Kendall is able to maybe drop some of those links of some of the great accomplishments because mm -hmm. it's true. Far too often um the antis, right, get to dictate mm -hmm. the narrative of what's going on with public education. And unless you're somebody who's in the trenches, then you just assume, oh, Arizona bottom three, along with Mississippi and Alabama. I mean, I don't even, but the fact is that we have amazing educators who are doing incredible things with the absolute bare minimum. And I stand proudly alongside the various educators that I've met throughout my career as an educator myself, to just say, you know, we're, we're going to keep doing this thing regardless of all the, what are those things called where you put the tape and it, it, it pops your tires, <laughs> you know, like the, the tape when you're driving along and then like strip. Anyway, sorry, bad metaphor. I should at least have known the name of it. Um, so this one is coming to us from Mike and Mike says, hi, Kathy, what can you do as superintendent if anything uh, to bring light to how the ESA money is being used? This is a really good question because oftentimes what I've seen in, you know, like uh, articles, social media, they're like, oh, Kathy Hoffman, there's no oversight and she's not really doing the thing or whatever. 
But so what can you do to bring to light how the ESA money is being used? If it's fraudulent, can anything be done? And can you talk about what you heard when you were in Snow, Snowflake specifically? Yeah, lots, lots of ESA questions. Um, so we we do bring light to how the money is being used. So like I was saying, even just talking about how with the, the new applications that we're seeing the majority over 75% of that money will be going to private schools. Um, there's also transparency in um, by when because there are times when we have to require parents to pay money back to the department if they have spent the money in a way that is not allowed by a state statute, then we work with the attorney general's office and have a process for telling them, hey, like that's not allowed. You need to spend, you need to pay that money back. And, and we do audits to, um, to help us keep an eye on that. Um, but if a family has a right to an appeal process, and so we have had appeals that go um, through a board process and it, that ultimately goes to the State Board of Education for approval. And so that's where people can actually see what are the types of things that families are appealing. And I also find some of those to be really concerning. So for example, we had uh, families purchasing $400 bar stools, um, a, a home water filtration system for a kindergartner, <laughs> um, all kinds of concerning things that are st straightforward. Not That's not education for your child. I'm sorry. Those are home improvement types of things. Um, so we, um, our teams see, see a lot of a lot of creativity out there of um, how families are um, utilizing the ESA funds. Um, what happened in Snowflake was I was visiting schools up there and heard from community members that there had been a, a private school specifically for kids with autism. So all the, uh, the families were using the ESA funding since they qualified as students with disabilities for the school for um, this private school for kids with autism. But then this past, this, at the end of this last school year, they um, shut the doors, closed the school with no notice to families, leaving them, leaving these families with kids with autism high and dry to figure out alternative education options for them. So, and I mean, this is, so I, I think that Mike's question too is about like, what can we do those of us who are really concerned about fiscal conservatism, local control, small government, um, is there something that we can do when we find out about this, you know, the, the lack of oversight, how the money is being spent, the fact that these folks in Superior were just basically left like high and dry without, you know, a fully funded classroom. Is there anything we can do? Is there like a... Um, you know, a, a, a watchdog group that could help us to file complaints or check in on those uh, entities. I mean, the, the real action was the referendum, which I'm so, you know, we're also feeling a bit heartbroken um, about the result of that. Um, that was, that was ult the ultimate uh, action we needed to really put the, put a stop to, uh, I mean, this is going to be a massive amount of hundreds of millions of dollars funneling to private schools, people profiting. I think we're going to see a lot more private schools pop up. Um, they could be religious, they could be political. Again, they don't, they don't need to have certified teachers um, to be operating. They don't need to be providing meals to kids. There, there's just, it's like businesses. They're, they're, they're not held to any of the same standards that our public education schools are held to. So I expect that there will be more outrage when people realize the significant amount of money that our taxpayer, that our tax dollars are going to with, um, without really knowing what the, what the end result is for, of um, how we're ensuring those kids are successful. So because it seems like it's all but decided that, you know, despite the valiant efforts of Save Our Schools Arizona and all the incredible volunteers that, you know, put so much time and effort and energy into this, like, <sighs> let's just go ahead and assume that this is going to be the law of the land. And for those of us who, like you said, I know that for me, as I've started to look at some of these private schools and what it says on their, you know, 
organization charter or their statement of faith or whatever, what I've noticed is a lot of what seems state sanctioned discrimination where they can pick and choose whatever the students they want. Um, they can employ uh, discriminatory hiring practices. Like what can those of us who are still here, who love the state of Arizona, who treasure our public school system, like what can we do going forward to make sure that this kind of state sanctioned discrimination and lack of accountability you know, isn't happening and specifically reserved for those who are in the millionaire and billionaire class. Well, this is where our call to action is to, of course, get involved with my campaign, get involved with other candidates' campaigns. We have a lot of really competitive LD races like yours, Jeannie, <laughs> uh, making sure that we're, we're getting people involved in campaigns because I think that the ultimate power is lying with our legislature, with the governor's race. There's um, there, you know, right now is it we we have is it what two two weeks till ballots drop? Um, so I think this is the time to take action and get involved with our candidates because if we can have elected leadership that is supportive of public education, then then we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> right on. So quick question, last one. Um, uh, so if we do somehow uh, flip the legislature. If we if we have enough seats to be able to have a different majority in 2022 and 2023, what would people be able to do to reverse this position, this decision? Um, well, yeah, theoretically it could be turned over and repealed, um, but it would have to be by the legislature. There would, there would have to be votes on both sides and then signed by the governor. So it really, it also depends who's who's going to be our governor for for that type of action. But yeah, election, elections matter. Um, they really make a, a big difference. Well, and I sure hope that people are paying attention to, you know, like I always joke around, you know, the, the national races it's like a gateway drug you get really excited because <laughs> there's all these sound bites and it's on cnn and mm -hmm. msnbc fox news but you really got to pay attention to what's happening in your own backyard so for you um with your race that is happening and again uh former superintendent tom horn was not able to make it tonight what would you like us to know you know, that separates you from him? And why should the folks who took time out of their schedules tonight uh, bubble in that part of their ballot for you, Kathy? Um, well, as, as a mom, as an educator, I am very passionate about thinking about, you know, knowing what our schools need and moving our state forward to serve all of our students across the state. Um, I, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's hopefully I've made very clear to everyone, this is not a political stepping stone for me. This is a passion for public education and for our students and for our future and thinking about, you know, my daughter, Clara, will be starting preschool in just a few short years and then kindergarten um, and our, you know, our state doesn't even fund preschool or fund full day kindergarten. So we have a lot of work to do here in Arizona. It's a lot of urgency for me around these important issues for all kids. Um, so I don't think Arizona wants to look 20 years backwards. I don't think we want a career politician leading our Department of Ed because it wasn't that long ago that we had that. And um, I feel like we've, you know, over the past couple of years, but we are now in a much better place as the work I've done to turn around the Department of Education to be an agency of service and to make sure we're championing public education. And so I, I look forward to that second term and uh, we'll, we can link my uh, campaign website is electkathyhoffman.com and hopefully everyone's following me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, so that you can follow along with the messaging that we're putting out there and, and hopefully turning out a strong voter turnout. And yeah, it's just coming up right around the corner, but can't wait for this November. Well, thanks again, uh, Superintendent Hoffman for, for joining us tonight. You are the first out of our statewide candidates to accept the invitation. We sure do appreciate you. Mike says, I'm so ready to get 
to work helping Kathy Hoffman? Should I go to the website? Is that what I need to do? And I do believe that Kendall went ahead and dropped all those links in there. So you've got work to do at home with your daughter, Clara. So go ahead and put her to bed Thank and you. the rest of us <laughs> will just be grateful for your service. And the fact that you answered the call to step up because we need more, more people like you in public education. So thank you, Superintendent Hoffman. Thank you, Jeannie. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. All right. Take care, everybody. See you next time.